how my sorcerer fought his way out of hell and eventually broke the world by user the random spook man. If you have a story to share please post to our subreddit linked below now let's get into the story. Pros 1 The Awakening. This is the beginning of the story of Primum Brightstorm, also known as Adam Brightstorm. He was my character in a game that spanned two viral years. The other consistent player character was Kreth, the aforementioned iridescent dragonborn paladin with scales like crystals. We had a few other players jump in and out. Lith and Gizzard appear in the pros but are unimportant in the grand scheme of things. The grand plot of the campaign was that the apocalypse of all apocalypses was happening. Earthquakes, zombies, plague, the corruption of magic, eldritch abominations, genocide. It was all happening at once and was being fueled by the personified god of the end of all things and all planes. This evil god was also slowly killing every other god and plane. Primum, Kryn, and Lith were three of five ancient warriors who had eons ago fought against this god of all ends and were awoken to do so again. A young man stirred in a silent, wet cave. Brown of hair and light of skin, he wore rags and had no shoes. The cave was completely black and the floor was rough and cold to the touch. When he brought his hand to his cheek, it was wet. He heard the scrapings of two other bodies to his left and to his right, and as his keen eyes adjusted to the dim light, could make out a faint path ahead of him. He was very thin, and his legs shook as he attempted to rise. He crawled away on his knees, then hobbled to his feet and made his way toward the light. As he walked, feet bare on the cold, wet ground, the rock around him slowly came into focus as rough, grey stone, stalactites and stalagmites shrunk to reveal a tunnel smooth and carved. The light grew and the cave suddenly opened into a grand, circular chamber. There was a second pathway leading out on the exact opposite side, and the ceiling domed up to a large opening, through which violet light poured. He could see swirling blues and purples of a sky, with silver stars winking across its sea. He stood, mesmerized by its beauty, until a whisper disturbed him. He tore his gaze away to focus on the only object in the room. A large stone chest, with carvings etched across its walls. Though he could read them, he didn't know what language it was. In fact, he seemed to know almost nothing at the moment. Even his name only barely tickled the edges of his mind. The chest bore five words for him. Malak, Kret, Adran, Lith, and Rit. As he read the third one to himself, something clicked in his head, like recognizing an old uniform. As he stood and pondered the words, a second whisper brushed his mind like a feather, and he found himself beckoned toward the chest, as if someone eager were calling his name. He let himself glide across the floor, which was dry and smooth here, toward the chest and its inscrutable markings. As he reached the chest, the beckonings became more powerful, pulsing, flowing, pulling, forming a steady tide of want and need impossible to resist. With a heave he lifted the stone lid and observed its contents. There were five objects, each more stunningly beautiful than the last. Firstly, a bow carved in golden glyphs. Its string long since disintegrated, lay against the side. Atop it, the black hilt of a curved blade of silver that looked sharp still. Across that blade lay another, a magnificent sword, shining of steel and obsidian, with delicately etched lettering running up its flat side. A long, black staff sat discarded beside it, its tip ending in two narrow forks and with runes as blue as the ocean was deep winding up its length. And lastly, Tucked down in a corner, a small object, like a forked branch, lying on top of an ancient patch of leather. Could it be a sling the whisperings were coming from the fourth object, the staff. Adam reached an arm down and wrapped one hand's fingers around it. He staggered as the whisperings tripled, turning into him, searching his body and begging him to bring forth something. He lifted the staff out of the box and followed them with his feelings deep into him until they stopped in his chest and seemed to point. Hesitantly, he reached further until he felt something warm, close to his heart. As soon as he did, the whisperings swirled around him, pulling. He grasped the warmth with his thoughts and ripped it up to the surface with all the strength he had. The black staff in his hands exploded with the light of a yellow star, 
outshining the sky above and illuminating the circular chamber. Adran closed his eyes and smiled. The beckonings ceased, and he felt belonging. The light dimmed to an even glow, and Adran came to himself with a sudden clarity. He turned and ran back the way he came, carrying the light with him, out of the circle chamber, through the tunnel-like cave, to where he woke up. He found two figures staggering to their feet, shielding their eyes from his sudden light. Both were scaly. He went to help the one on the left, a humanoid with green scales, slit eyes, and clawed hands. Adran set the stuff on the ground and helped him, it seemed to be a him. Up, he also wore rags, and the remnant of a cloak. The creature rasped a breath, then wheezed out who are you? Who am I Adran? Adran Bright. Oh, what another voice. The other figure rose to his feet. He was magnificent. He also had scales, but his were translucent and segmented like diamond and glass. With every motion he threw golden sparks of light across the cave as the staff reflected off him. He stood tall, a warrior's build, strong arms and shoulders, and piercing, focused eyes. Adran crossed to him and held out his hand. Adran, you the being took it. I... I don't know. Adran picked up his staff and looked to the green one. Lith, I think. Adran shook Lith's hand and turned down the tunnel. We should go. Then. Wait. What about them? The warrior was pointing at two dark lumps Adran's mind had mixed in the stone and rocks. As Adran brought the light over, the crystal man grimaced. Two near decomposed skeletons laid in the cave next to each other. They were an elf, like Adran. Their skin and muscle pull tight around their bones, and their eyes shriveled, deflated peas within their sockets long since dried out. Their clothes were almost completely gone, save a few tatters. Adam pulled back. I don't think those two will be waking up, Lith said. He hesitantly put a hand on Adam's shoulder. We have to leave them. The trio solemnly turned their backs on the bodies as Adam led them toward the circular chamber. Where are we I can hardly remember anything. The dragonborn asked yes. Adam thought he remembered that term. And thought it fit the tall, iridescent brute standing next to him. So what was the other one something also scaly? HMO. Ah. Yes. I'm not sure. But it feels important. This way. They came to the large room. Lith and the dragonborn ordered the natural light filtering through from the mesmerizing skylight above. Adran wished they could see it as he had, without his light intervening. Curious, he closed his eyes and searched his feelings until he found the warmth again. This time, he gathered it back up in his arms, restraining it like one restrains a small, excited dog and containing it. When he opened his eyes again, the staff was dark. The chamber lit up violet, and Adran embraced it, but when he looked back at Lith and the dragonborn, they were ignoring the grandiose sky above them. They were both fixated on the center of the room, on the large now open stone chest. Adran took a step back and allowed them to glide forward, and slowly reached down. Lith pulled out the small stick, the sling. He wrapped both hands around it and whispered. The dragonborn retrieved the massive black and steel sword with runes and similarly closed his eyes, kneeling down on the stone floor. They held still for a moment, and while neither of their weapons exploded as Adran's had, they both glowed with a soft blue light throughout the moment of silence. When both lights faded and they awoke, they regarded their objects with newfound reverence. The dragonborn knelt in front of the chest, and began to murmur the written words to himself as Adran had. Malak Krehi jumped to his feet. Brandishing his blade in the air, Krevat me Lith glanced at the chest. Then I suppose, Malak and Rit. Adam finished, turning back toward the mouth of the cave. Nothing we can do for them now, Kress said. It's best to move on. Maybe we can find out what happened to them. To all of us for that matter. In their honor, Adam nodded. Right. This way then. Yo I don't know about you guys but I am starving. And we need clothes. Kre led the way through the chamber's exit. The hallway beyond was of smooth stone, inclined upwards, with intricate carvings covering the walls. With no light source, Adam turned his eyes inward and again sought the warmth within him. He didn't have to search nearly as deep as the first time. 
Now that he'd woken it up, the power seemed to boil just under his skin, waiting to be pulled out and shaped with a thought. He dipped in with his mind and directed a strand of the light only he could see from himself to the staff. The staff lit up again, casting dancing shadows down the hallway and glittering off Kre's body. Curious to experiment, Adam twisted the strand of power like tuning an instrument. The staff's light shifted from yellow to orange, then red to purple. He settled on a cool blue, and rushed to catch up with Kre and Lith. His face smacked right into Kre's back. He rubbed his forehead and leant around Kre to see ahead. The hallway was coated in blood. It was ancient, and would have been missed without Adran's light shifting and giving the blood away by its sheen. It swirled down the hallway, toward them. Away from faint silvery light ahead and up. Like a vortex sucking them away toward their fate above, the blood and walls swirled around the trio as they ascended toward the mystical sky, growing in their wake until they emerged into the open air. The elf, the dragon, and the lizard stood on a large, flat platform. A hole they just climbed out of. Another hole a distance away that must be the skylight of the dome room, and a rock pyramid beyond it, the top of which appeared to be an altar of sorts. The ground was of grey stone, but as he shifted, Adran noticed tufts of grass peeking through cracks in the ground. The grass blew in a breeze he could not feel, and as it shifted it revealed hundreds of mounds laying the ground around them. These bodies were nearly completely gone, and the mere weight of his gaze seemed to wilt them away. The sky above swirled violet and blue, and the silver stars varied in size. Some were particularly large, almost as if they were closer. They cast the corpses in an eerie tin light, offset by shadows of blue and purple. Adran reached inward and with a flick was able to shift his staff's light to the silvery glow of the stars as the three hesitantly picked their way toward the pyramid. Kre held his sword defensively, and as they approached, Adam could have sworn he felt a faint pulse from the pyramid, a heartbeat in the very air, but beyond the air, into his soul. He also could have sworn that the blues and purples of the sky behind the pyramid seemed to dip, almost as pouring themselves into a hole at the top of it. Adran walked past a corpse, barely a skeleton left. He thought he could make out the shape of armor, but everything else was turned to black dust, and as he watched, a few flakes fell from an already gaping hole in the face onto the ground. The heartbeat grew stronger as Adran slowly began up the pyramid steps, the coarse rocks scraping against his bare feet. He followed Cray and Lith, who made their way much more brazenly, their scales protecting their delicate souls. As Adam turned around, halfway up, to see the view, he fell back, clutching the steps as he was yet again shocked. The sky was below them too, and on both sides, and straight ahead. Indeed, it seemed they were on an extremely small world, floating in an endless, empty expanse of blue, violet, and silvery starred sky extending in all directions. Gasping, he crawled on his back up several steps as terror gripped him. Red blood dripped as he scraped his right arm against the stone, and he closed his eyes, taking deep breaths to calm himself. He forgot his staff, forgot his strange light, forgot the rock, his companions, and the very sky above him, forgetting everything for a few moments, slowing his breathing until he could open his eyes. As Adwin came to terms with his surroundings, he noticed something in the sky to his right, a black gash. A stain breaking the morphic pattern of the sky. It hung ominously, like a great offense to all the rest of the universe. It had no stars in its inky blackness. Adran grabbed his staff and continued, cautiously, upwards. Cray and Lith were already at the top, marveling at the scenery. They looked down on him with concern before turning back to study something on the floor. What is it he called as he approached? Cray turned I don't know. But considering our options right now, Adam reached the apex of the pyramid. Looking above him, the sky swirled like a whirlpool or spiraling disc. It centered directly above them. Tilting his head down, a massive pool of liquid white light rested at their feet. One of the stars had been plucked out of the sky and used to fill the bath. He walked around the pool to the opposite side of the top. The pyramid continued down to a sheer cliff that dropped into infinity. 
the other three sides proved the same. The ugly black stain mocking him from his now left as he returned to his original position. Four pylons rose from the corners of the pyramid's top. They bore faded mythical carvings of five figures doing battle with some great black mass of tentacles and plague. The carvings were too old to make out any further details. Lith was crouched by the pool's edge. Illuminated by its glow, he reached one hand down and dipped it into the plasma. Adren flinched as he gasped and pulled his hand out. It's like it tried to suck me and Crow was inspecting the pylon diagonal to where Adren was standing. I think we have to jump in. I think we're meant to- What do you mean Lith asked? Well, these figures look a bit like us. He pointed to some chicken scratch. There's no way you can make anything of that. Well what other choice do we have it's faded. But I think I can read some of this. I'm seeing a few words like portal and saved until fate and what surely means destiny Adran certainly couldn't read any of this. But why would Krell I Krell continued. I think this portal might lead to a world. Like. A regular world. Not this. He gestured around. Well. Lith said. You first. Krell circled to him. Together. Krell held his sword in his left hand. And took Lith's left arm with his right. Adran took Lith's right arm with his left and clutched his staff with his right. Together? Okay. Count of three. Wait. One. Two maybe. Three Krell leapt, pulling Lith over who towed Adam behind him. As soon as he touched the liquid, Adam was sucked under smoother than any liquid should have allowed. He fell through silvery light, riding a current that spiraled and twisted as if it couldn't decide to be a whirlpool or cliff. He couldn't see, and only could feel Lith's arm and his staff. He felt as though he were being squeezed and bent end over end, falling down a drain. A great rhythmic force pressed them forward. The heartbeat of the pyramid, pulsing in Adam's very core. The light and pressure increased. And just as Adam began to fear death by crushing, the pressure broke and crisp. Cool air blew against Adam's face as the light gave away. A second later Adam felt a great crash. All his breath was knocked from him as a new view spun into existence. Turning end over end as he felt his arms acquire bruises and his face gain cuts. As soon as it had started, the world jerked to a standstill as Adwin crashed into Lith, who was in turn on top of Kray. The glare faded from his eyes and Adwin was able to study the world around them. There were trees. Large. Brown and green nature things. He knew what they were but didn't know how. Also, the sky was strikingly blue. Not blue like where they'd woken up. But light blue, like a child's eyes. It felt right. Not that the violet and blue sky had felt wrong, but this felt normal. Also again, there weren't any stars, but one massive lantern hanging in the sky. Adam quickly decided he didn't like that as much. His eyes hurt from trying to look at it. His hand felt grass beneath him, as well as a softer substance. It started with a D he was sure. Adam rolled to his knees. They had tumbled down a mound. The dirt that was what it was called gave way to rough stone, almost in a triangle-like incline, up to a low, flat peak that looked very weathered and cracked, leaving it slanted. His tattered clothes were even worse for wear. Now, behind him, Lith and Cress slowly got up and observed the world around them as Adam had. Lith reached under himself and extracted a small silver square. Glinting in the sunlight as he turned it before shrugging and tossing it aside. Luckily, none of them had fallen on Kray's sword, and Adam's staff was a stone's throw away amongst the grass, and lit. Lith still had his sling in hand. Glancing around, the wood stretched in all directions. Kray climbed the side's pyramid to get a view of the area. Adam examined the mound. He reached out and felt ridges in the dirt. Perhaps the recent footprint of someone in heavy boots. Kre came back down to report he could see the roofs of some buildings in the distance. He suggested they make for them. Lith and Adam agreed. The three marched out into the wilderness, enjoying the cacophony of sounds and smells. The song of small birds. The soft grass beneath their feet. The smell of pine and berries. Kre led the way with his sword. Together the dragon. Lizard and Elf began their first steps on a journey that would shape the world irrevocably and cement their place in the repertoire of storytellers for all time.
So I hear you guys are into thick big titty wafers. Well we got you covered at nickbedlier.co.uk. One stop shop for coom jar models. However we do sell a lot more than just smut models we got everything for running any fantasy settings and even some not grim dark science fiction models. In fact we even have some anime inspired models and video game. But if models is not your thing we also have some role playing adventures and dnd 5e meme subclasses. Also every video we will be giving away all our homebrew content to a subscriber of the channel. All you got to do to be in with a chance is subscribe. Today's winner is this guy. Well done. Claim your prize by contacting us via email at nickbedeercontact at gmail.com. Now let's get back to the video. So that's the basics. But you're here to read about this hell business. Well look no further. Because at one point about a year in the campaign our characters took refuge in a dwarven city built into a cliff. By now all of our characters had racked up various curses and ailments. Our bullywug bard was suffering a windigo curse, one of the many magical plagues running around. The dwarfs believed that the use of magic was to blame for all the apocalypses, and so magic was religiously outlawed. Here's the catch. All of our characters could use magic, and none of them spoke dwarvish. One thing led to another and Primum was captured to be executed. Pros too. The Hell Battle. The elf Primum Brightstorm was hauled and chained down the dark stone corridor toward a room up ahead. He wore only a plain shirt and trousers. The colors on his skin rippled and warped jarringly, frequently bleeding away and revealing a fair complexion. He grimaced in deep pain. The black gemstones on the chains were repressing Primum's innate magical abilities, and it hurt a lot. The chains were held by dwarven warriors in front and behind him. They pulled him into a large circular room lit by torchlight. In the center of the room was a large pit. The dwarven king, dressed in finery, stood to the side, accompanied by his loyal translator who smirked maliciously at Primum's entrance. His majesty spoke. For your crimes against his majesty and your illegal practice of magic, the translator interpreted for Primum's benefit, you are hereby sentenced to hell. Primum struggled and cried out in protest as he was brought to the edge of the pit. The stone pit stretched down into black infinity, and when he looked long enough Primum thought he could see the smallest spark of red and orange infinitely far down. The translator walked around to the opposite edge as Primum struggled fruitlessly against the four guards. The smirking dwarf held something out over the pit, just long enough for Primum to see that it was a silver key then he dropped it and it vanished into the bottomless darkness. Then the guards threw Primum in. Primum screamed and screamed as he fell down and down. He desperately tried to evoke his magic. But it was suffocated deep within him by the chains and he couldn't call even a single spark to the surface. He spun end over end in the darkness and eventually passed out in the air. He woke up in pain with his clothes tatted. He was lying on cracked, crumbling earth. As he sat up, he found himself surrounded by sand and fire with an endless smoky sky above. He was on a massive slope that seemed to stretch infinitely in every direction. He searched his immediate area until hours later he found the silver key in a sand dune. He unlocked his chains, exhaling a sigh of relief as they fell to the ground and his skin returned to its usual, calm strobe-like colors. Then he began to walk. He didn't know what to expect, but he chose to walk horizontally along the slope. He walked for hours and eventually saw a distant figure as the slope began to flatten out. It was tall, at least thrice Primum's height. It was black and thin, with long sharp claws and horns. It seemed to be made of condensed amorphous shadows. Primum began to turn the other way but it was too late. The creature of hell saw him and eight more began to appear on the horizon in all directions around Primum Brightstorm. Primum's first instinct was to lay on the sand and accept his inevitable fate. After all he was literally in hell and these beings had come for his soul. Primum considered his magic strong. But Tez found his eyes as he doubted himself against even one of these beings, let alone nine at once. He cried for a moment, then shook himself out of it. No, he would not die like this. There were people who were counting on him in the real world, and real responsibilities. 
The least he could do for them would be to fight to the very end. As the infernal beings approached, their nightlight black bodies in stark contrast to the fire and sand around them, Primum summoned his magic. It leapt into his waiting arms like it missed him and he unleashed an arrow of orange flame from his finger at the nearest demon. The fire fizzled against the demon's chest and a tiny amount of its inky body seemed to melt away. More fire leapt from Primum as the demons neared. Unperturbed, they surrounded him and began to take swipes. One caught his shoulder, not tearing his flesh but leaving tracks of black death where it touched him. Primum laughed in terror as he ducked and rolled to avoid the claws while unleashing as great a magical salvo as he could. Fire and lightning flung from him in chaotic lances and the earth rippled beneath his feet with every step, helping him move. He led the nine demons in a discordant dance across the blasted landscape of hell. He landed many strikes, but so did they. Soon his body was covered in streaks of dying flesh and he called upon a significant portion of his magic, whisking himself away through a warping of space, falling to his knees some several hundred feet away. Primum caught his breath and stood up as the demonic howls echoed over him. Back in the real world, within a stony mountain, a great warrior of resplendent diamond-like scales sat in an infirmary, watching over a frog-like man in a bed. In his bag was a parchment with the mortal names of deities written upon it, many with excess over them. Some circled. On this parchment, the name of the goddess of magic suddenly appeared and became circled, signaling her imminent death at the hands of the apocalypse. Outside of the infirmary, a group of dwarven warriors approached with a writ of deportation. Back in hell, Primum reached deep within himself as the demons traveled toward him. One of them had been slain, but he could feel that he was nearly dead. All it would take would be another swipe or two from their claws and his body would wither into nothing. Suddenly he felt an all-encompassing sense of panic that was not his own along with a touch of divinity upon his soul. It was a feminine presence and he heard a voice. Please. It said. Time is running out. Primum felt the hand of the goddess of magic upon his soul. A thread of his soul was guided through the multiverse of reality to the nexus of all the magic itself. To the throne from which the goddess of magic governed all arcane forces across existence. This thread of his soul was weaved right into that nexus and he heard a voice again. You must take this chance. Change Primum changed. Magic unlike any he had ever felt flooded his entire body and mind. He could hardly think. Acting on instinct he allowed the magic to warp his body. His skin became thicker, his eyes became many, and he grew and grew until he was level with the demons. The smoky sky above became dark with thunderous clouds and lightning bolts cracked through the air. The air around Primum warped as he sprouted tentacles. The transformation complete. Primum was now a massive amphibious arcane monster of the deep sea with two dozen powerful tentacles. Four legs attached to a large body, and five rows of Razorus teeth. The demons attacked. Primum shrieked and attacked back. The ensuing battle was biblical in scope and glory. In this form Primum Brightstorm maintained his ability to work magic. His body became a whirl of teeth and tentacles as a barrage of lightning rained down on the demons. Their shadowy forms anamorphically molded around his whipping tentacles but their bodies leaked sprays of black fluid at his teeth. The lightning blasted apart chunks of their heads and chests. The demons flowed around him, raking his sides with their claws. He whipped in a circle, knocking some of them back with his tentacles. He opened his mouth and unleashed a blast of flame, scorching three of them. The great dunes of sand melted and shifted to this battle as driving wind and lightning buffeted the demons. The demons fought unceasingly, but one by one they fell. First to a barrage of lightning, then to a wave of sand. One was detonated by a magical explosion of white light. Primum seized another with several tentacles and guided it into his mouth before grinding down with all his teeth. The demon let out a howl that pierced the din of battle before exploding into black sludge and silver fire. Then there were two. Primum's powerful form was weak with more of its surface flesh dead and alive. His new magical reserve was rapidly running dry. The clouds above grew less angry and lightning lashed down only half-heartedly. The final two demons lunged at him from either side. Claws bared. He responded in kind with tentacles. 
He seized one and turned to it as the other stabbed him in the back. He bit down hard and popped the one he'd grappled into sludge. Black Death raced along his back as Primum turned to the final demon in one last all-out attack of might and magic. The demon froze as an aura of lightning crackled into existence around it. Primum seized the opportunity and fell upon the creature with hundreds of teeth. In a short manner of moments, it too was finally gone. At just that moment, the Black Death encompassed Primum's whole body and this form failed him. It melted around him leaving him laying in a pool of black sludge. Some of it from the demons and some from him. His own true body was covered in dead flesh and he was completely out of magic. He passed out. Back in the real world, as the prismatic scaled warrior and sickly frog man fled from the mountain on a white winged horse. In the warrior's bag the goddess of magic's name on the long piece of parchment became crossed out in scrawling black ink. Signaling her final and permanent doom. 48 hours later in hell, Primum awoke. He felt tingly all over. While he had slept, this new source of magic had worked on his body, reverting the damage caused by the demons. And it had also made other changes. His skin no longer strobed and shifted. That had been wiped away and replaced with a faintly reflective gold tone. As Primum stood up, nausea struck him and he held his head, only to discover that he was now bald. He cried out in shock that his beautiful brown locks were now gone. Touching his face, it seemed he had lost all hair across his body. Then he felt his magic. Before he had considered his magic capable, but now he felt as if he was basking in the light of creation itself. Tiny threads connected him to the whole world around him, and if he wished he could touch one, enflame it, and affect magical change seemingly however he desired. Curiously he stretched out one hand. A coronous beam of white energy shot out, scorching the sand black where it passed. Primum let it stop and held out his other hand. Ripples of mutagenic energy flooded from him, transmuting the very sand of hell into fertile soil and stimulating the growth of green grass and bushes over a small area. Primum smiled, then laughed aloud in jubilation and love of magic. He spun in his tattered clothes, unleashing a great shower of sparks of all colors across the ruinous hellscape. Primum stopped, then thrust both hands forward. Thick blue flame rushed from his chest down his arms and into the air before him. It pulled into a small levitating oval and Primum slowly pulled his hands apart before him as if he were ripping a hole in cloth. He thought of Cray and Gizzard, his two closest friends and only true companions. He thought of how they loved and needed him in the face of impending doom, and he likewise them. He thought only of his desire to be back home as he pulled his hands apart and the blue flames acted in kind spinning and ripping a hole through space and reality. Back on a huge stony cliff overlooking great open plains far below, the resplendent warrior Kred of dragon blood and sickly frog man gizzard of bardic talent sat solemnly and stared out over the plains. Primum had been taken from them for trying to steal components for medicine to cure gizzard, and they thought him executed. Kred placed a scaly palm on gizzard's soft froggy shoulder. It'll be okay, gizzard. He wouldn't want us to give up here. Gizzard made soft rivets sadly and clutched his bugle for comfort. The sudden crackle of flame startled both of them. They turned to see a swirling vortex of blue flame. Cress stepped between it and Gizzard and readied his sword as Gizzard readied his bugle. As the vortex grew the interior cleared, revealing a sandy, fiery, smoky scene. A blast of hot air and the smell of sulfur hit the two and in the center of the portal. Hands covered in blue flame, eyes emitting white light, bald with gold skin, they saw their close friend Primum Brightstorm. He stepped through the portal and allowed it to collapse behind him, letting the flame and light die from his hands and eyes. He blinked in the evening light, then focused on Cray and Gizzard. He smiled and took a step to them. His words were cut off by the warrior Cray crying out in joy and breaking into a run, closely followed by the froggy man. Kre tackled Primum, knocking the air out of him and hugging him close. Gizzard jumped on top of both of them, wrapping his long cold arms around Primum. All of them laughed and shed tears of delight. Gizzard got up off the pile and, holding his bugle with both his hands, blew into it with all his might, sounding off a jubilant chorus that echoed off the mountains and cliffs. Kre's winged horse pranced around the three of them, 
sensing his master's excitement. Eventually, all three friends stood together again. Primum spoke. Thank you for waiting for me. I need some rest right now. He smiled. But tomorrow I think I'd like to drop by to pay the Dwarven King a visit. That fight is the single most epic and memorable moment of any game I've been part of. Before the session I had created a whole new character to play, assuming Premium would die in hell. The GM decided to play out an RP Premium's death in game, to make it official. But the dice had other plans. Everyone at the table was standing and screaming as I rolled multiple nat 20s and the GM kept rolling critical failures on behalf of the demons. All rolls were made in the open. Premium turning into a kraken was part of our GM's homebrew mechanic where a dying player character could attempt to transform into a powerful magical beast in their final moments, and the goddess of magic just helped him along. In the end, Premium single-handedly defeated 9 CR20 demons and earned enough XP to rocket himself from level 13 to level 17 in one night which in turn gave him access to the 9th level gate spell which let Primum simply walk out of hell itself. We like to say that the soul of Gary Gygax himself came down and touched our game that day. After that, the campaign quickly rocketed into epic level territory. We battled Eldritch demigods on the regular and traveled across other planes as more and more were devoured by the evil god and absorbed into his dark stain of nothing. We flew past level 20 and into homebrew prestige classes and epic boons. We became demigods fighting against impossible odds. It all ended at this giant tower that I will not explain the importance of, but I will say that the tower is but a few days travel from where our characters were first dumped into the world by that silver pool so long ago. Ash fell from the sky onto an endless landscape of destruction. The crumbled remnants of a once great tower lay strewn, each piece hundreds of spans in width and overgrown with black itcherous vines. The sky above was shattered like glass by cracks of black. Beyond the cracks, a dark presence looked down resentfully. The ash stirred in a spot. Premium rose. Breathing heavily, he brushed his cloak. Once red, now black. He observed the vile presence. Premium's irises sparked with light. His golden skin shivered. And he looked away. He began to walk and soon a shadow passed over him. Looking up Premium saw a winged horse, pristine white. It descended, landing beside him. He reached for it and whispered are you all that remains of your master Premium pulled the mare into an embrace and could not help but to cry. He was finally alone in the universe. His final and closest friend, the finest warrior in all the plains, had been taken from him. A while later, a mewling drew his attention around a boulder and he discovered a winged feline. Its body was white, its wings were many colored like a tropical bird, and it had a blue stone set into its forehead. The cat leapt into his arms and he scratched its ears. Both of them were desperate for some kind of comfort. It's good to see you survived, my companion, Primum said. The elf, cat, and horse walked they were too tired to fly until they came across a small crater in the ash created by the violent impact of an object. A beautiful blade as long as the man was tall lay in the crater. Long ago it had been black and silver. Now it was stark white with a refracted aura. It bent light with its holiness. Premum reverently bent down and retrieved the weapon, carefully wrapping it up against the horse. He stowed the blade in the simple saddle. We will remember your master, and his sacrifice. The traveling trio could not rest. The presence unnerved them. Its malice forced them on, and they fled the destruction. The sun splintered as it passed around the presence and reformed on the horizon as it set. Only when night came did Premium, the winged horse, and cat finally rest, collapsing against a fallen oak tree. Premium laid in the ash. Both his mind and body were exhausted. The cat fluttered onto his chest, and the horse settled nearby. There were no more gods, so Premium cursed by his own name. Oh me. What will we do did we save the world who is left we will find them. The three of us. Weakly. Premum raised a palm into the air. Perhaps he could divine an answer his magic barely stirred. It felt dull in his chest. Dumb. Hours ago Premum had worked the greatest magical wonder that had ever been done in memory. Now his power failed him. He was beyond drained. 
It was as if magic itself no longer functioned the way it once had. Somehow, a few hours ago Primum had impacted and probably damaged the entire force of magic. His hand dropped into the ash and he spoke softly to his final two companions. We will find whoever is left and protect them. We can't let the world die now. Not after all we've done. The final battle of the whole campaign was ended by Primum in one turn. In a single combat round Primum was able to seal the evil god out of the material plane. But this single round also resulted in the final and permanent death of Kray and the near breaking of the weave itself the source of all magic. It involved three wish spells cast simultaneously. Epilogue. There were remnants of surviving civilization across the world. Primum became the leader of a guild dedicating to the preserving of magical and historical knowledge and the management of magical artifacts. While spellcraft was damaged by Primum's actions at the tower, magic items worked the same but were harder to create. With a heavy heart, Primum would continue to do his best to watch over humans, elves, and all other races as the world tried to put itself back together. He would try to find a way to bring Kre back, but would always fail. Closing. Obviously a lot has left out but here are a few honorable mentions from the campaign. We defeated Sharmat in one round. Hint. It involved a bag of holding. Premum destroyed nearly an entire army of devils with one major casting of divine word. We lived on a dragon island that no longer had dragons but did have religious monks who were taken over by undead and wendigos. Primum in particular suffered several psychological breakdowns. The more powerful he got, the more weak he felt. What's the use of being able to bring one person back from the dead every day when you're faced with a genocide numbering in the hundreds of thousands of genocide you may have accidentally caused when it seems like everyone in the world has already died? Are you really fighting to save anything? Primum was so powerful he won every fight. He only wished the fighting could stop, the killing could stop. He begged every villain and monster to change their ways. Please don't resort to violence because that only means I'll have to kill you too. Well we hope you enjoyed this story. User the random spook man wrote some summaries about the story linked to below and if you have any of your own stories you want to share post them to the subreddit. Hope you guys enjoyed and we'll see you next time.